like writing a... My lawyer is up there. I would check in your notebook again and see if you have that review packet. Wait, you mean this uh, review packet? His name, if that's just period right there at the beginning of the third week, if that's RP, his name is crossing. Oh, that is the wrong time. Okay. I was looking at the uh, other question. Yeah, because it's just just period. That's Devin, not Donovan. Uh, I do. Okay. I know it is hard to see, ooh, especially this one right here. Um, Hey, uh, Caroline and McKay, are y'all talking about math back there? Yeah. Oh, yeah, my dad does happy math. Okay. Um, what questions do you have off of these problems, whether it be uh, 1 through 6 or 15 or 16 to get us started with today? So the type of growth means like the function of it or the whatever it's called? Yeah, well, type of growth, yeah. When we say type of growth, um, what rate of change is there? Yep. Hold on. Wait. Number one. Yeah, those additive rates of change or multiplicative rates of change. What if you put a linear? So you can say that it's a linear function, um, but that's not the type of growth. So what makes a linear function linear? It's that repeated addition, that additive rate of change. Right? So like an arithmetic sequence is defined by an additive rate of change. A linear function is defined by an additive rate of change. The growth itself is additive, repeated addition. Does that make sense? Okay. So you are good at you're good on the side of identifying that it's linear or exponential. You just need to recognize what makes it that is that additive or that um, multiplicative rate of change. And on the other side, instead of multi multiplicative, I put exponential. Right. Ex and, and yeah. So the multiplicative rate of change makes it exponential, but what's the growth? It's multiplicative. Okay. Um, and I will point this out. I just made these scales to be what I want them to be. It's hard to see what the scales are on that page. The big thing you want to notice is for a linear function, it's a straight line, right? Or for an additive rate of change, it's a straight line. But for that multiplicative rate of change, it's a curve. Alan, have you looked at number three and checked your tables and figured out where yours went wrong? I got both of them wrong, so I'm trying to understand what you're doing. You what? Doing. Huh? I'm trying to understand what you've got on the board and what you're going over again. It looks like you were just staring at your hands. I was right. just in my brain because it hurts my hand. But then take it off. The focus on your mat. Does that say 16 or 36? Where? 12. On your Four, 12, geometry. 36. Yeah. This one right here? Yeah. That's a 36. Because what's the rate of change? What am I repeatedly doing? Multiplying by 3. Right. 4 right. times 3 is 12. 12 times 3 is 36. 36 times 3 is 108. You just look like a 16. You couldn't really tell. Hmm? You look like a 16 from back here. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a 3. All right. Um, one thing I do want to point out is on this one, I started with negative 1. Um, but I could have very easily started with zero. I could have even started with a negative two. Right? Over here, I could have started with negative one and gotten some points there. I just, just depended where I started. Now, I need you to hear me very clearly on this. On your test, you will have to make a table based on an equation. Like, that will be a part of your test that you have later this week. So... How do you think I got these points on that table? By first adding 4 plus 3 and then adding 3 after each. Um, you know what I mean? Like every time you get your answer, like when you got 7, then add 3 more to 10, then 3 more to 9, like, just the same. But how, why is this a 7? So I would agree, like it's an additive rate of change, we're repeatedly adding 3, but like how did I get a first point? Um, Okay, but what's the starting point with y equals 4 plus 3x?
one or zero. Which one? One, negative one. Yeah, that's where I started the table at. But I mean, it's a line. Can it keep? It can keep going either direction, can't it? So you think one, Caroline? Huh? You say four? Is zero a point? Is one a point, or is four a point? I wouldn't quite say they're all points. I would say none of those are points. In order to have a point, don't you need both an X and a Y? Oh, yeah. You're making this way too complicated, guys. Does it matter what your input is? No? no. So can I just plug a negative one in? Notice, Mona, it's not 4 plus 3. Multiplication needs to happen before you add. 4 plus negative 3 is 1. That's just me plugging in the negative 1. I could have plugged in the 0. Because what's 3 times 0? But you do that first to get the first x value. No, you make up, remember, the x values are your independent variable. You can plug anything in that you want. You plug it in, and you get your y out. Mm -hmm. Notice what's, I plug in a 0. What's 4 plus 0? 4. And you can do that for every point. Now, once you get a couple of points, you can just start adding 3, because you recognize that additive rate of change. But... Notice, if I plug in a 2 to the equation, what should I get out? 10. So let's check. 4 plus 3 times 2. What's 3 times 2? 6. 4 plus 6? 10. Okay. Every point in the table should make the equation true. true. That's it. So plug your points in, or plug your x values in, and get your y values out. The same thing holds with... All the points over here. If I plug in a 2, I should get a 36. What is 3 squared? 4 times 9. Does 36 equal 36? So remember, you're just plugging those x values in to get y values out. You don't have to make it more complicated than that. Okay? Um, any questions here? I do want you to notice, I did not just say, hey, whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. First off, that does not explain why I divided by 3, or multiplied by 1 third. Secondly, do you all have any clue why whatever I do to one side, I have to do to the other? Anybody? Because they're equal, they're inverses, whatever. But does that explain why what I do to one side I have to do to the other? No. Okay. We will talk more about what are called the properties of equality and inequality next unit, but most of us don't fully understand what that means to say whatever I do to one side I do to the other. That's, and that's not why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's why I had to do it to both sides, but what's happening between 3 and x right now? They're being multiplied. What's the inverse of multiplication? Division. Or, you can say, and that's why they here show the division, or you can use the reciprocal. Because what does this fraction right, bar right here mean? So aren't I still dividing by 3 right now? <laughs> right? That's explaining, right? Multiplicative property, right? And the multiplicative identity, right? 3 divided by 3 is 1. What's the inverse of subtraction? Addition. Addition. You gotta read the instructions. They told you to do this. Negative 10 plus 10. Okay. Negative 10 plus 10? Not just cancels. One. Not yeah. one. See, that's the issue with just saying it cancels. Zero. It's a zero. Notice. 3 divided by 3 was 1. Negative 10 plus 10, though, is 
zero. Those are very different cancels, and we need to be aware of that. Because if I said x plus 1, that would not be completely gone. We'll talk more about what are called the additive identities and the multiplicative identities next unit. But we need to notice that we're trying to create that zero, right? That's the additive inverse. All right. We'll talk more about that next unit. Um, that's already happens up there. But notice they literally have examples of what to do. I don't think I saw anybody or maybe one person who actually used those justifications. Read your directions, guys. I need you to read your directions. All right. Let's get started with today from this point. So we'll look at our objectives and look at 2.10 making my point. Linnea, can you read our first objective? I can write the equation of a linear or exponential function given any representation. Okay, so like when we're writing equations, we're talking about algebraic representations. But what are other mathematical representations that you could be given? Okay, give me one. Tabular. Tabular representations. Mona, give me another mathematical representation. That's a rate of change, but that's not a mathematical representation. That is a, uh, that's a type of function, but that's not a... Um, Mathematical representation. McKay said tabular. Caroline, give me it. Graphical. Tables, graphs. Give me one more, Donovan. Well, the equations are the algebraic, right? We're trying to create those equations. We're looking for two more. Say again. Y'all know? Verbal. Verbal representations, right? Using our words. There is one final one that's not as common, but, or at least we haven't used it as commonly. It starts with a P. Pictorial. Pictorial, pictures. Is McKay the only one who's listed? And, and Caroline, when I've talked about the different mathematical representations? So, so you were calling on people, you didn't say. It. That's true, I should have left it yeah, open. It should have been open. Question. That's my bad. But I was trying to get others involved. But Mona, Donovan, we got to know those. Pictorial, tabular, graphical, and verbal. Those are, and then algebraic. Those are the representations that you can be given and expect you to give me an equation. We need to be able to determine whether a function should be discrete or continuous based on the appropriate domain of the function. Um, by the way, Brandon, remind me to let you jump to a different group once we get started soon, okay? And then we can create a graph given the equation of a linear or exponential function. So. Uh, from what I understand, Mr. Lipham got it all started here. So when we look at linear equations, we have three different ones that we can use. Now, a recursive formula can only be used with what type of function or type of model? Discrete or continuous? Continuous. Discrete can or recursive can only be used with continuous? Yeah. Do we all agree with that? Linnea? I think it's You think it's discrete? Okay, so we got differing ideas. McKay, why do you think it is continuous? Good feeling. Good feeling. Got to have evidence. So keep thinking on it. Recursive. Can it be used with continuous or discrete? All right, Linnea, do you have any evidence for why you think it's discrete? Anybody else? Oh, yeah, look. Yeah, guys, we had to read. Dang. Remember, for a recursive equation, you're looking at f of n and f of n minus 1. So are you getting anything between the current and the previous? Mm -hmm. You say yes or no? For discrete, no. no. Right. Well, and for recursive, no, that's why it's discrete, right? There's nothing between the current and the previous for a recursive equation, right? It's just that first term, the second term, third term. So you want to recognize that. Whereas slope-intercept point-slope can go for either, right? 
Pay attention to those names, right? What two things would you need for slope intercept form? A slope and a y intercept. That's why it's called slope intercept. Alan, what two things would you need for point slope? Think about the name. That's it. A point to slope. Now we need to remember because this is why, like, we haven't explicitly named these until recently, but realistically, what is a slope? It's what type of rate of change? Linear. It's a linear function, but what are you repeatedly doing when it's a slope? Added. So it's an additive rate of change. Linnea, how do we show repeated addition? Through multiplication, right? Look at these equations. One half times x. M times x. Right? One half times x minus 4. M times x minus 4. That slope is multiplied because that's my additive rate of change. Now, I want you to remember something. If we're talking about a y-intercept, anyone remember what the x value is for a y-intercept? Braden, do you know where a y-intercept is located on a graph? Uh, the vertical. So on the y-axis? Yeah. Okay. McKay, do you know what this point would be right here on the y-axis? Two, zero, two. Zero, comma, two. Mona, do you know what that point would be on the y-axis? Which one? I made it up, right here. This one, right here. Four. Yeah. Right. What? Four, comma. I know four going one of them. One, two, three, four. Five. I thought you started out to zero. I do. Okay. That's right here. Zero, I thought zero. I was a zero above you. <clears throat> Say that one more time. I thought I was a zero, the one above, not the one you The right. x-axis is where the zero would be. One indicates it's above that zero. So we have a five. Is, is that five going to be here for the x or here for the y? Y. Okay, so then what's the x value going to be? Well, if here's negative one, and here's positive one, what's in between? Zero. So the x is zero. Alan, what do you think this point would be? Uh, zero and negative two. Donovan, what would this point be? Zero comma negative what? I think six, yeah. Caroline, do you see anything in common for all of those points on the y-axis? Do any of those points have anything in common? What about zero? Value. Brian, what do you think of that idea? That we have a zero in for every x. <laughs> and does that look true? I want us to think about it. If here is negative one in the x, and here is one in the x, what is everything on the y-axis going to have for x? Zero. That's in between negative one and one, isn't it? Okay. So when I talk about a y-intercept crossing the y-axis, what is the x value always going to be? Zero. That's an important detail to understand the y-intercept and when do you slope intercept form. I want you to notice, let's say I were to plug this point into point slope. What's the x value? Zero. Zero. What's the y value? Six. 
Uh, what is x minus 0? Uh, x. I know there's a formula we've all seen very well. Y equals mx plus b. Because what is the x value? <laughs> The slope inter or yeah, the slope intercept is point slope just when x1 is 0. That's it. Does that make sense? We good with those ideas? Okay? Mm -hmm. And then we need to be able to identify exponential. Now, one thing I do want to point out, because I don't like this detail about exponential that they have here. Notice it's understood that this is x minus 0 up here. So you have 0, 10 as the starting point. For an exponential function, do you always have, wait, what is this point called when the x value is 0? Y intercept. Do we always have a y intercept to start with explicit? No. In a lot of ways, uh, with exponential, you can treat it like the point slope where you have x minus x1. It's just here would be your y1. So. Be aware of that, but once again with a recursive, it's only going to be for what type of model? Recursive. It's for what type of model? Discrete. Discrete. Okay. I believe Mr. Lopin already talked through this yesterday. The idea is that you need to be aware and think through what type of problem you're given or information you're given. If you have a screw that you need to put into a piece of wood, you're not getting out a hammer. <laughs> that would not work out very well, right? That would break whatever you... That's my point. So you need to be able to think through, hey, what is the situation that I'm given or what am I working with to figure out what tool you're going to use, whether you use point slope or slope intercept or the recursive or whatever, right? Pay attention to what's being given and being asked of you. Does that make sense? You good with that? Good, good, good job on the response. I appreciate it. All right, number one, quickly though, right? Uh, Mr. Lipman was telling me yesterday that some of us were struggling with this idea about i as a function of n. Does that sound like something we were having trouble with a little bit? Yeah. Does anyone know how we would read this statement right here? F of x. F of x, meaning the function f of x. x. Okay. The function f of x. So when I say i as a function of n, i of n. I of n. I That's of n. it. Okay? Mm -hmm. I of n, yes sir. No, not I. That's not mathematical. Okay? Now, did this problem end up becoming discrete or continuous? Discrete. Discrete, right? You're looking at each individual vacuum being sold, and you can't really sell a quarter of a vacuum, so you can't get everything in between, right? So, what domain did y'all look at for something that was discrete? Domain. Whole linear. Whole numbers. Right? So the set, the domain, and I just wanted y'all to practice this, the domain would be the set of n. Why do you think I'm using n here? Well, not just that. It's the independent variable, right? It asks us to do i as a function of n. N is my independent variable. So it would be the set of N when N is an element of the whole numbers. Whole numbers. Whole numbers. Why did y'all choose whole numbers instead of integers or natural numbers? Mm -hmm. Anyone know? Because that's what we did. What numbers are we talking about when we say natural numbers? Is there, are there any numbers from this set whoops, that we're missing if we're talking about selling these vacuum cleaners? Mm -hmm. Which number? Zero. Missing zero, right? Could you sell zero vacuum cleaners? Yes. I mean, if you sell zero, it means you didn't oh, sell any, right? Could you sell zero vacuum The answer is yes. You didn't sell anything, right? So we'd be missing that um, important number there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why we can't do natural numbers. What would be the issue with integers? Because it does negatives. It does negatives, right? It can't tell the negative of a vacuum. 
And so I will make this note, you still could use integers, and those I believe. You would just have to say the set of n when n is an element of the integers, comma, n is greater than or equal to zero. So notice I'm making it be integers, but in zero or greater. So like that would be a possibility because I would eliminate the negatives, but it's easier to just say whole. This is the <laughs> okay. Oh. All right, I think y'all talked about it yesterday, but number two, we're giving a slope and a point. So, Alan, which equation would we probably want to use here? Given a slope and a point. Point slope. If you're given a slope and a point, point slope fits the bill, doesn't it? So, and what I would personally do is I would label everything, because that will make it easier to write my equation. Now instead of subtracting a negative, how could you subtract a negative? What mathematical operation is the same as subtracting a negative? Adding. Adding, right? So I would just go back in and make that a plus. Okay. Yes, I do. Now, if this is a line, would this be continuous or discrete? Discrete. So, here's an actual line. Notice it doesn't just say linear, it says it is a line. Does that look discrete to you? No. Now, that's not necessarily this exact problem. I will point that out. Um, but yeah, that, that is definitely not discrete, that would be continuous. Which is why you could use the interval notation for domain. Say negative infinity to infinity. You could also say that the domain is the set of x when x is an element of what, what number set is all the numbers? The real numbers. Right? So you can do the set notation here. Or you can use interval. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions about that before we move forward? Alright. I think several of y'all already got through three. Both threes, I don't know if you noticed there were two threes. But I do want to give y'all some time to work within your small groups. That took longer than I expected. So, uh, Braden, just jump into a group um, that you would feel comfortable talking with them. Okay? And we'll get started on working through our groups. Let's make sure we are actively engaged in talking about what the equations might be, the type of function, things like that.